Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to the next installment of our Nuclear Deterrence Forum series. Now, as all of you well know, the United States is currently modernizing our nuclear triad, along with its associated command and control systems. Now, the level of commitment required to do this has reawakened debates over the importance of the triad, nuclear deterrence concepts, and the necessity of sustaining this capability. Yet at the same time, we live in a world where nuclear proliferation continues with Iran and North Korea as two prime examples. Russia has aggressively modernized its nuclear capabilities, and China is undertaking a massive buildup of its nuclear inventory. Bottom line is there's much to discuss on this topic, and that's why I'm particularly pleased to host today's panel with retired Air Force Lieutenant General Frank Klotz and Dr. Alexandra Evans. They recently released a report assessing the state of play of triad modernization, the status of current capabilities, modernization details, and the arguments, both pro and con, regarding these issues. Now, General Klotz currently serves as an adjunct senior fellow at the RAND Corporation. He was the first commander of Air Force Global Strike Command. And most recently, he was the administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration. Past that, he's a longtime friend. So, Frank, thanks for being here. Um, we also have Dr. Alexandra Evans, who's an associate policy researcher at RAND. Uh, Dr. Evans, welcome to you, too. So to give our audience an overview of your work, let me turn this over to both of you. And uh, Frank, why don't you start first? Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dave, for your always kind words and always warm welcome. Uh, and for the opportunity to participate in another of the Nuclear Deterrence uh, Forum uh, hosted by the, the Mitchell Institute. I thought it might be useful to begin by explaining first the reason why Alexandra and I wrote this report, uh, and second, our research approach and methodology. So let me explain the former, and we'll let Alexandra describe the latter. Uh, as Dave alluded to, uh, shortly after taking office, the Biden administration announced that uh, it would review the nation's nuclear weapons and arms control policies as part of an integrated approach to deterrence across several domains. In a shift from past practice, they indicated that the nuclear posture re review would be nested within the administration's forthcoming national defense strategy, still expected to be released in the very near future. Now, uh, like many of you, I'm not privy to the contents of the uh, latest version of the NPR. Uh, but if it, it adheres to the precedent set by previous NPRs, it will undoubtedly include decisions on the size and composition of the U.S. nuclear deterrent force. For the past six decades, the United States has maintained what's called a triad of long-range nuclear delivery systems, including nuclear-capable bomber aircraft, intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, and nuclear powered submarines armed with submarine launched ballistic missiles or SLBMs. Beginning with the Obama administration and continuing through the Trump administration, the United States has pursued multiple programs of record to modernize all three legs of the existing triad, including fielding a new class of ballistic missile submarines, a new bomber, a new version of the nuclear armed air launch cruise missile and a new ICBM. These investments represent the first sustained efforts to replace US strategic nuclear delivery systems since the end of the Cold War more than 30 years ago. These nuclear modernization programs have enjoyed broad bipartisan support over the past decade. Likewise, um, but nevertheless, uh, some members of the US Congress have express reservations about the initiative's cost and necessities. Likewise, several influential non-governmental organizations within the arms control community 
have argued that funding can and should be scaled back. Various options to reduce costs of nuclear modernization have been floated, but the program of record most often cited as a candidate for suspension or even outright cancellation is the new ICBM, which for now is known as the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent or GBSD. The fate of GBSD and the triad uh, will depend not only on the outcome of the Biden administration's NPR, but also on the degree of continuing support for the current modernization programs within Congress. As the service responsible for two of the three legs of the triad, uh, the Air Force has important equities in any decisions affecting US nuclear policy and related modernization programs. As in the past, Air Force officials at all levels uh, will be required to develop and articulate service positions on matters discussed within the NPR uh, as they meet with their interagency uh, partners and colleagues, as well as in congressional hearings and other types of engagement. In approaching this task, it is important, it's very important and useful to develop a deep understanding of the history of current policies and capabilities. In other words, to know how we got to where we are today and how the past is likely to shape the possibilities for the future. Unfortunately, when it comes to uh, nuclear weapons and arms control policy, much of the institutional memory uh, on how we got to where we are today has faded since the end of the Cold War and during the two decades that we were heavily engaged in military operations in the Middle East and in South Asia. And I, com I commend the Mitchell Institute for the steps that it is taking to sort of re-educate uh, not only military officers and government officials, but indeed the general public on the importance of nuclear deterrence and the various tenets associated with it. Now, Dr. Evans and I uh, wrote this report uh, with those Air Force officers very much in mind uh, to provide them a single, concise, unclassified, and readily accessible document that explains the historical background and rationale for maintaining and modernizing the triad, and that identifies the key arguments for and against fielding a new ICBM. At the same time, we also recognize that this report might also prove useful to officials and other government agencies on Capitol Hill and for anyone else who's generally interested in the major policies uh, confronting us as a nation today. This is very much in keeping with RAND's long history of helping to improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis conducting, conducted on behalf of the Air Force, the other military services, the Department of Defense, various government agencies, and at state and local institutions. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Alexandra now to uh, discuss uh, our methodology in uh, uh, preparing uh, this report. Great. Thanks, Frank. I should mention up front that the report is available on the, on the RAND website. Um, and a caveat as, as you review it and for the conversation today is that we did not aim to produce fundamentally new analysis. We did not perform a program evaluation or develop an independent cost assessment. Um, but what we did do beginning last spring is we undertook an extensive review of official government documents, public statements, uh, congressional hearings, but also because we really wanted to understand this landscape and to identify the alternative options that have been debated and to identify sort of the contours of the conversation also non-governmental analysis, uh, work from the scholarship that's being developed in the academy and other sources to understand uh, what the, the sort of the debate over the nature of US nuclear policy is and the aspects of the triad moving forward that are informing the decision to modernize um, and the nature of the specific programs that are that are currently underway. Um, all of our research is unclassified, as is the final report. You know, certain aspects of this topic have to be reserved for a classified setting and, and for good reason, um, but the issue is too important, we thought, to limit the conversation to a closed forum. And then also for that educational purpose uh, that Frank mentioned, that we wanted this to be a document that could be circulated widely and that would be accessible for different audiences that may not have necessarily engaged these questions before, but have a growing interest in understanding the contours of the debate. 
Um, so the resulting report uh, is written at, the high, at a high level. It outlines the basic tenets of US nuclear policy, provides a historical overview of the programs underway. Um, and though we do cover each of the three legs of the triad, we really focus the second half of the report on GBSD because uh, the ICBM program has attracted particular attention. Um, and for those who are interested maybe in some of the more programmatic aspects or diving a little bit deeper, we included a pretty hefty bibliography at the end uh, that we hope will be a useful resource. Um, but while, you know, before we turn to the Q&A, we can, I think both of us are eager to talk about uh, some specific aspects of what we found in the debate. I think what we wanted to really emphasize is that the debate over these issues, although GBSD and the ongoing program at large have captured a particular intention, attention and galvanized a new debate, the public, from the public literature, we, we still found that the core questions under consideration are variations of debates that have been unfolding in the field really for decades. You know, as they say, there are no new issues, there are only new action officers. So we hope that this can inform both the current discussion, but also considerations about modernization moving into the future. With that, pass it back over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much um, for those uh, insights. Uh, I do commend the report uh, to all in our audience to read in its entirety uh, as it's an excellent resource. Um, so now let's dig into some of the points uh, that you uh, both have uh, raised and uh, we'd like a little more elaboration on. Let me start with Frank. And uh, this may be a, a bit of a basic point for some, but I think it's always useful to ground folks in the core arguments regarding why we have a triad. You know, you did a great job in summarizing the, summarizing the key tenets in the report. Uh, would you please run through those for our audience just to get us all on the, on the same wavelength? Uh, sh sure, Dave, I'd be happy to. Uh, as we point out in the report, uh, despite the changes that have taken place in the U.S. nuclear posture, nuclear doctrine, and nuclear technology over the past 75 years, uh, several core aspects of U.S. nuclear policy have endured. Uh, the first of these is the belief uh, that the fundamental purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear attacks on the United States, uh, its military forces, and its allies. Uh, the second is the calculation that the United States can best deter nuclear aggression and achieve strategic stability by maintaining uh, nuclear forces capable of surviving a nuclear attack and retaliating in such a way that denies the attacker its objectives and imposes devastating consequences in the process. Similarly, U.S. strategists have long held that decreasing an adversary's confidence in its ability to decapitate U.S. nuclear forces reduces the incentive to launch a first strike in a crisis or conflict. Third and lastly, uh, U.S. policymakers have repeatedly asserted that the survivability of U.S. nuclear forces can best be ensured by maintaining a mix of nuclear delivery systems, each of which complements the other's attributes and compensates for any vulnerabilities or technical failures of the others. Now, this latter concept <clears throat> underlies the U.S. decision to develop and maintain a mix of nuclear forces operating in the air, land, and sea, as I mentioned earlier, known as the, the triad. Uh, it has become a central feature of U.S. nuclear weapons policy, uh, starting um, ever since the United States began to field its first operational ICBMs and SSBNs in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Yet even with uh, significant reductions in the number and type of U.S. and Russian nuclear forces after the end of the Cold War, successive presidential administrations, both Democrat and Republican, have chosen to retain the triad. However, for the first 20 years following the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, two administrations in a row uh, departed from past practice in one important and notable respect. 
uh, throughout the Cold War, uh, the United States continuously updated all three components of the triad by designing, developing, and deploying successive generations of nuclear-capable bombers, ICBMs, and nuclear-powered submarines armed with SLBMs. Each new delivery system and its associated warheads uh, represented significant improvements over their predecessors in terms of capabilities, safety, and security. That approach a cont of continuous updating changed at the end of the Cold War. Rather than designing, developing, and deploying new delivery systems, both the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations chose in effect to live off earlier investments and extend the service life of existing nuclear force capabilities. As a result, uh, the, U the United States has not procured any nuclear capable missiles or bombers since the last B-2 was delivered to Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri in 1997, 24 years ago. That approach began to change in 2010 under the Obama administration, but I'll pause here because uh, Dave, I suspect you'll wanna ask us more about the current programs later on. Uh, no, thank you very much for that. I think that uh, kind of puts everyone uh, in, in perspective uh, and, and those who don't normally follow this uh, issue area have a better uh, insight as a result of your your response. Now, uh, Alexandra, the nuclear deterrent landscape is changing markedly given actions by Russia and China, uh, as well as the increasing role of technology. Uh, could you walk us through what other actors are doing when it comes to building their own nuclear weapons capabilities? Yeah, the unfortunate reality is it's, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, the United States now must account for two major nuclear powers, Russia and China, uh, who've expanded and diversified their nuclear capabilities and are continuing to refurbish and modernize these arsenals. Uh, these programs aren't finished. Um, so if, if we start with Russia, uh, who, you know, for the foreseeable future is likely to remain the most capable of the two. Um, I think, you know, Putin has claimed that 80 percent of Russian systems have already been modernized, and that's probably a stretch. Uh, but it is clear that the country has made substantial progress in upgrading and replacing its Soviet era strategic and non-strategic nuclear weapon systems. And over the last decade, we've seen improvements to each leg of the Russian triad. Uh, they're currently replacing uh, existing ICBMs with a newer model, the SS-27, Mod 1 and Mod 2. Um, and there's a new heavy ICBM, the Sarmat, which was planned to enter service in 2021. Um, Russia's also modified a few of its remaining SS-19 ICBMs to carry a hypersonic glide vehicle, which is, I think, a, a powerful example of some of the new technologies uh, that, that are emerging and shaping this environment. And then at sea, they've developed a new class of ballistic missile submarines, um, which are going to be armed with a new Balaba missile. Um, in the air, they're, they're planning to field a new stealthier version of their long-range nuclear-capable bomber and to start production of a next-generation bomber, the PAC-DA, by the end of the decade. Um, and then at the same time, you know, moving sort of beyond those, those traditional systems, uh, Russian senior officials have publicly touted what sort of often described as exotic long range delivery systems. Uh, these are things like the Poseidon nuclear powered underwater autonomous vehicle. Um, and, and notably, these aren't covered by New START. So it's another area we can see sort of probing in a new direction. Um, and then, of course, all of this is occurring against the backdrop of sustained investment in new air and missile defenses. Um, and, you know, as we saw in November, new counter space capabilities that are of concern for the United States. Um, but moving beyond sort of the, the actor that has been the focus of, of U.S. nuclear policy for so long, China also now can no longer be considered a lesser included case in U.S. calculations. Um, there's a lot of discussion that the, the evidence of the new missile silo construction captured public attention, um, but it's also sort of the latest public example of an effort to really change the number and type of nuclear forces uh, that, that China maintains. Um, there's improvements that are both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, so according to, to recent public government assessment that was released, uh, China's current activity puts it on a trajectory to at least double the size of its nuclear stockpile over the next decade. Uh, that would be 700 deliverable nuclear weapons by 2027 and at least 1,000 warheads by 2030. And 
it's important to, to keep these numbers in context. Uh, they, it's a substantial increase for China um, and it's exceeded DOD projections. You know, even projections that were published as recently as 2020 did not anticipate uh, this, the sort of the intensity and the scale of this buildup. Uh, but China still maintains a much smaller nuclear force than either the United States or Russia, and, and that's likely to, to stay in place. Uh, but in addition to this quantitative change, um, they're also improving and diversifying their forces. Uh, China has been deploying a, a new road mobile and multi-warhead DF-41 ICBM. Uh, it's completed construction of a second generation ballistic missile submarine, um, which will allow it to maintain a continuous at sea presence. Uh, and there's also some public reports of an even more capable class of submarines and submarine launch ballistic missiles that would potentially allow it to, to target the United States from littoral waters uh, by the end of the decade. Um, and then, and this is a, a major change, uh, China has developed its first nuclear capable air to air refuelable bomber and was reportedly is developing a nuclear capable uh, ballistic missile that could be launched from this aircraft, um, as well as maybe a, another stealthy uh, strategic bomber as well. Um, so this is really the culmination of, of multiple decades of investment uh, in these programs um, that combined with improvements in some of the uh, areas of captured attention from the conventional side, um, some of the missile defense systems, for instance, really adds up to a, to a worrisome picture for American planners. Yeah, that's kind of an understatement. Uh, uh, Frank, given everything that Alexandra just covered, um, what does this mean for the U.S. as we seek to ensure that we have a, uh, a relevant uh, deterrent strategy and a requisite uh, set of capabilities? My, my sense is that um, some of the Cold War paradigms uh, that we have embraced are in need of some major updates. Uh, what are your perspectives? Well, I think my answer to your question, Dave, is no and yes. <laughs> uh, first, the no. Um, some things remain essentially the same as they were during the Cold War. Uh, Russia still has nuclear weapons, though smaller number as a result of agreements with the United States, arms control agreements with the United States and unilateral decisions. And those nuclear weapons are capable of attacking and posing an existential threat uh, to the United States and its allies. So in that sense, mutual nuclear deterrence uh, remains the principal means to avert this threat to our security. Uh, also, uh, contrary to the halcyon days immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union and the optimistic forecasts about how relations with Russia and Europe and Russia and the United States might evolve, Russia unfortunately remains an adversary and U.S.-Russian relations have become increasingly fraught and tense as uh, we are all now currently witnessing. So to be perfectly honest, I'm not so sure, regrettably, uh, that all that much has changed since the Cold War, at least as it pertains to the purpose and the policies governing, uh, governing uh, the U.S. nuclear deterrent force. Now, does the paradigm need to change uh, in another sense? Yes, uh, because uh, China is a very different matter. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, as many have said, um, as far as our nuclear planning uh, was concerned, uh, China was always considered as a lesser included case. In other words, if you had sufficient forces to deter uh, the Soviet Union, uh, you also had sufficient forces to, at the same time, simultaneously deter China. As uh, Alexandra just very uh, uh, carefully laid out, uh, the Chinese are engaged in a substantial, even some have called it massive, uh, buildup of its nuclear capabilities, despite its policy of, in the past, only wanting to maintain or claiming to only want to maintain a minimum deterrent and espousing a no first use uh, policy. Uh, China is now described as a pacing threat uh, for the United States in nuclear matters, as well as in space and elsewhere. Uh, and um, 
uh, leaders like uh, the commander of U.S. Strategic Command, uh, Admiral uh, Chaz Richard, uh, have pointed out uh, that we need to better understand how deterrence works in a world in which the United States and its allies face not one, but two nuclear peers or near peers. Moreover, a world in which there are other nations that seem to be embarked upon the path of developing nuclear weapons, and in one case, the capability to uh, threaten uh, the United States directly uh, with nuclear weapons. Now, I will add, um, I actually uh, am fairly confident um, and optimistic that we will be able to satisfy what Admiral Richard and other people have called for. I've been very, very impressed uh, with the um, background, uh, the education and the training of uh, colleagues at RAND uh, in the nuclear uh, realm. Um, as you know, Dave, there has been a lot of work in developing curricula uh, at the military academies and professional military education schools uh, to uh, ensure that we build up the intellectual bench strength of uh, officers and non-commissioned officers uh, in discussing issues, debating issues, developing um, programs with respect to uh, nuclear policy and nuclear capabilities, things like the SANS program uh, that's conducted through the Air Command and Staff College. So I think we'll be able to get to uh, Admiral Richard's remit in terms of developing those paradigms uh, that are necessary to deal with not one nuclear peer, but two nuclear peers. Yeah, very good. Um, it, it is uh, <laughs> getting more complex out there. Now, uh, Alexandra, could you bring us up to speed on the current triad modernization effort? It's a little more uh, technical and specific, but what were the key drivers pushing folks to develop a new generation of uh, capabilities other than uh, age? Uh, well, we, we shouldn't put age aside. I mean, that there are uh, aspects there from uh, the, some of the sustainment challenges, which really are a result of uh, changes in the industrial base because of uh, and, and the effect of natural aging as well. Um, but the, the current modernization program, you know, although we are hoping to see these systems uh, come on board, you know, at the end of this decade, uh, the origins of it really are in uh, the Obama administration and, and in 2010 in particular, uh, when the administration released a, a nuclear posture review that established the groundwork for this modernization program. Uh, the, the public version of the document directed the Navy to begin technology development to replace its Ohio-class submarines. It instructed the Air Force to begin a formal assessment of alternatives to determine whether, and, and if so, how uh, to replace its nuclear-capable air launch cruise missile. Uh, and it also instructed the beginning of an initial study of possible alternatives to replace the Minutemen three. Uh, rather than um, life extend, and that really established the framework for the current uh, decision to proceed with GBSD. Um, but beyond the, the, the decision within the administration, the effort gained new momentum uh, in, amidst the, the debate over ratification of New START. Uh, the, the president ag agreed to what's sometimes referred to as a grand bargain with the Senate, um, which was that in exchange for Senate approval for ratification, there was also an agreement uh, to certify an intent to modernize or replace the triad before the treaty entered into force. Uh, and this was reinforced again with subsequent legislation, uh, which required the president to certify annually in writing uh, a commitment to modernizing and replacing strategic delivery systems. Um, and since 2010, you know, there were multiple rounds of review, um, which have resulted in a decision um, that some programs could be life extended uh, and that others really needed to be replaced, that refurbishment was not sufficient. Uh, so for, for the Navy, um, they've already repeatedly pushed back retirement to the Ohio-class submarine, uh, which by the time it does retire will have served longer than any previous class. Um, and they're moving ahead with the new Columbia class, which is expected to be delivered in 2028 uh, and to conduct the first deterrent patrol in 2031. Uh, and the Navy also plans to continue using the Trident 2D5 uh, submarine launch ballistic missile, uh, which was life extended, and, and they're pursuing a second phase life extension program there as well. Um, the Air Force is upgrading subsystems of the B-52H bomber, uh, which rolled off the production line in 1962. So you know, there are there are aging concerns. Um, 
but it's also developing a new generation stealth bomber. Uh, information about this is limited for good reasons, uh, but it reportedly will have both the nuclear and conventional role. Um, and then because of sustainment issues with the current air launch cruise missile, uh, the Air Force gained approval in 2016 to begin development of a long range standoff weapon, the LRSO, um, while also extending the service life of the existing warhead. Um, and then the ICBM, uh, there's this ongoing uh, program to replace the Minuteman Three. Uh, we're still waiting to hear GBSD's new name. I'm very excited to hear what it'll be, uh, although I'm trying to, to moderate hopes. Um, but the good news is it, it appears to be on track to reach initial operational capability in 2029 and full operational capability in the following decade. So things are moving along, uh, but we'll, we'll have to see if there's also the possibility of some sort of alteration from schedule. Yeah, no, thanks for that rundown. Um, as an aside, do you have a, a preferred name for GBSD? Uh, I tend to prefer to give my titles for anything I write to other people, so I'm going to hold <laughs> off on that. It's hard to beat Minuteman. That's a great name. Uh, we should probably avoid Midget Man. That's not a name to repeat, but we'll see. Okay, very good. We're also going to need some money for all of that, aren't we? Uh, and I'm not going to put you on the spot here. I'm just going to make a suggestion to the group. You know, since we've been in a, we were in Iraq and Afghanistan after 2001 for that 20 year period, uh, the army got an average of $53 billion a year, more than the air force. Uh, and uh, we're not in Iraq or Afghanistan anymore. So it's probably time to shift that money uh, back to uh, help out both the air force and the Navy uh, in paying some of these bills uh, to modernize our, uh, nuclear triad. Anyway, uh, I, I think that's an important discussion item because you know, nuclear deterrence is the fundamental basis of this nation's security. Uh, and, and we can't be, uh, let me put it this way, in a positive sense, uh, and it must be funded. Okay, Frank. When well, we, let, me, uh, let, me, let me add something to that. Well, yeah, since, please uh, do. We're, we're off on this path. It, it also requires that there be a budget. Uh, for fiscal year 2022. Uh, we uh, have an authorization, a National Defense Authorization Act was passed and signed by the president uh, before the end of December. Uh, and, um, you know, the services are still awaiting a, a, a budget. Uh, we're currently operating under a continuing resolution. There has been hints, rumors, speculation that there might be a year long uh, congr uh, CR, um, continuing resolution. There's never been one for DOD in the history of DOD, but you know, we live in, we live in interesting times. Uh, that would be extraordinarily uh, unfortunate uh, for many of these modernization programs, including GBSD, uh, because one, they rely on additional funding as they continue to ramp up uh, their um, uh, engineering and uh, development. Uh, and and uh, two, uh, there may be aspects of their programs which might be considered new starts uh, that cannot go forward until um, the, um, uh, the until there's a budget. And this applies again not just to uh, to the nuclear enterprise; it applies to the space enterprise, uh, the other services as well. So that's extraordinarily important. So we need that sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'll just increase and I'll put a couple of exclamation points on the end of that. I mean, this, this demonstrates that there's a lot, but what, what I'm talking about, it demonstrates the lack of prioritization of passing um, the appropriations bills on the part of the military and the rest of the government demonstrates a lack or a failure of understanding by those members of Congress outside the armed services committees as to the serious state of our security as it exists today and the rapid acceleration, particularly of the Chinese military industrial complex to outpace us. They're not a near peer anymore. In many respects, they have exceeded US military capabilities. Okay, Frank, back to the subject area. Um, when we look at Russia's new novel investments in uh, nuclear capabilities not covered by New Start, the fact that China's not entered any arms control agreements governing its nuclear buildup, or that China and Russia have launched anti satellite systems that could be massively destabilizing, how do you help policy leaders understand 
that we face a very different set of circumstances that require prudent responses. Uh, because these are some challenges on a level that we haven't had to consider in decades. Yeah. Uh, well, that's an extraordinarily good question. Let me level set just a b- little bit and discuss uh, what arms control regime uh, that we currently live under and, and help decide whether or not that's going to be the way we should go in the future. Um, one of the first acts of the <clears throat> new Biden administration was to uh, extend the U.S.-Russian New START agreement just days before it was due to expire uh, in February of last year. Um, The treaty now runs until February 2026, and under the terms of the treaty, it cannot be further extended. So that's it. It'll be over um, unless it is uh, replaced. Uh, The treaty itself uh, places equal limits for both sides on the number of ICBMs, SLBMs, and nuclear-capable bombers, uh, the number that they can possess and deploy, uh, as well as the total number of warheads that can be loaded on deployed systems. Now, as uh, both you and Alexander already pointed out, since the treaty originally entered into force in 2011, Russia has publicly announced that it's developing several novel and exotic systems, and Alexandra enumerated uh, what those were. And as you just pointed out, Dave, China is not a party uh, to New START, and its nuclear forces are neither covered uh, nor constrained by any arms control agreement. In fact, uh, the Chinese have historically Uh, resisted being drawn into any sort of discussions uh, regarding their nuclear forces, Uh, even at the, you know, most informal track two level, uh, all the way through, uh, you know, official um, Chinese officials just will not discuss confidence building measures, security measures, transparency measures, much less anything related to uh, reductions. Um, There are a number of explanations uh, for this. Um, The Chinese argue that they're not going to engage in discussions with um, the United States or Russia on nuclear arms until both of the nuclear superpowers uh, significantly, drastically reduce their uh, holdings down to those closer to what the Chinese have. Um, I think a more compelling reason might be is that you know, the China, Chinese uh, nuclear force was so small uh, that, um, you know, secrecy was very, very important to helping ensure the survivability of that force. And the types of agreements we've entered into with Russia with uh, extraordinary exchanges of information uh, on a daily basis about where our nuclear forces covered by the treaty are located when they're moved, uh, uh, is would be an anathema uh, to the Chinese. So in any event, uh, nothing's gone there. And as some observers have pointed out, in a sense, the Chinese get a free ride in terms of arms control because they are not bound uh, by any agreements, but the, their two competitors, uh, potential adversaries, Russia and the United States are. Um, these two circumstances, uh, the development of <clears throat> Russian uh, exotic or novel systems that lie outside the purview of, uh, of New START, uh, as well as the fact that the Chinese with its rapidly expanding uh, nuclear capabilities are not covered by any uh, nuclear arms agreement, uh, have led senior military and civilian officials to publicly uh, state that any future arms control agreements will need to take into account the full gamut of uh, Russian nuclear forces including new systems, uh, as well as the more numerous non-strategic and non-deployed warheads, and that they will also need to take into account the implication of China's uh, rapid nuclear buildup for nuclear deterrence and strategic stability. Successfully negotiating a new treaty or expanding uh, a treaty to replace New START uh, by 2026, I think it's going to be an extraordinarily tough sell. Um, we all know about the deterioration of U.S.-Russian relations over the past several years. Um, 
We all know about uh, China's steadfast refusal to engage in any kind of discussions about its nuclear forces. Uh, this has led some observers, uh, arms control hands, to argue that we need to be thinking about alternative approaches to uh, formal, painstakingly negotiated treaties uh, to achieve uh, arms control objectives. <clears throat> uh, as uh, Thomas Schelling and Mort Halperin, um, part of the brain trust in the early part of the uh, Cold War and nuclear deterrence, uh, wrote in a seminal book on uh, arms control in 1961, uh, they argued that we ought to think about arms control on a, <clears throat> it's not just a formal, um, negotiated, ratified uh, treaties uh, that have the force of international law, but also ought to be thinking about everything from um, you know, informal tacit agreements to handshakes to uh, executive uh, agreements uh, and norms of the road and that sort of thing. So my own personal sense is, uh, and not part of our report, I hasten to add, is that the Biden administration's objective of uh, reinvigorating st strategic stability talks with Russia and beginning essentially for the first time, uh, at least in terms of anything meaningful, uh, a similar process with China uh, can serve as steps uh, in this direction. By the way, uh, uh, when you, if and when you go to the RAND publication website for a copy of the report that uh, Alexandra and I are discussing, you might also check out a, uh, a report uh, that uh, I did uh, a year before and discussed in the same forum on uh, on New Start, it's called the Military Case for Extending the New Start Agreement. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the agreement has been extended, but there's still, I think, some good and useful history and uh, explanation in there for those who want to know a little bit more about how uh, nuclear arms control fits into our overall strategy of maintaining uh, nuclear security. Very good. Thanks for that, Frank. Now, uh, <laughs> Alexandra, there's a powerful group of individuals who want us to consider extending the life of uh, the Minuteman III missiles yet again. Uh, and the Air Force uh, says this, in fact, will be more expensive than procuring a new system. Uh, could you speak a bit on uh, both sides of this argument? Of course, and this really gets to the, to the crux of the current debate. Does the United States need to develop a new delivery system or, or can it upgrade what it has? You know, as, you, as you allude, the Air Force has done this before. Uh, the Minuteman III, when it, when it was first fielded in 1970, was projected to have a service life of, of just 10 years. But thanks to multiple rounds <clears throat> excuse me, of life extension programs, they're still operational 50 years later and they'll have reached 60 years when they're retired in 2030. So this has raised some questions about uh, why can't we do that again? Um, the consistent message from the Air Force since 2014 is that it's, it's simply no longer technically feasible nor cost effective to continue extending the service life of the Minuteman III. Um, the first aspect of this is simply that the world has changed since the 1960s when the, first, when the, the system was first designed uh, and senior military officials have consistently made clear that a, a comprehensive overhaul is needed to deal with new and emerging threats and respond to a changing strategic landscape, as, as Frank and I have already discussed. Um, the Air Force also has emphasized uh, that to maintain the U.S. advantage in the long term, because uh, they're hoping to meet to, to build a system uh, that can that can be have a, a longer service life, um, requires a more adaptive system that can be modified easily to meet new or unforeseen challenges. Um, public statements suggest that that they believe the GBSD design could offer the possibility of incorporating future technologies, um, so that there is this this uh, sort of ability to adapt. Um, that and that isn't something that can be achieved through a life extension program. Um, and then there's this. The, ever present problem of sustainment. Uh, although that Miniman 3 was able to perform its mission reliably through 2030, uh, its facilities and infrastructure are exhibiting serious aging issues, and it's become difficult to acquire the components necessary to refurbish or replace some of the subcomponents, and then also for some testing. Uh, much of the specialized gear is simply worn out, uh, and the situations reach the point that missile maintenance technicians uh, routinely take two or three sets of critical pieces of equipment to the field to ensure that they'll have at least one that works. Um, 
And then there's the problem of cost. So uh, extending the minimum three is, is not a free or, or a cheap option. It would require paying many of the same costs of designing, developing, and fielding a new ICBM, but with none of those advantages of incorporating uh, 21st century technology. And the, the 2014 analysis of alternatives uh, is what the Air Force points to. Uh, that also, this was verified uh, by a subsequent Office of the Secretary of Defense Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, the CAPE Sufficiency Review, uh, which concluded that a baseline service like extension program would cost $1.1 billion more than a 50-year life cycle cost of, of the alternative missile. Um, and Air Force Global Strike Command has more recently pegged the cost of refurbishment and about 38 billion more than developing a new ICBM. So one analogy that we use in the report uh, is this is sort of similar to when you have a, a really old car. At some point, it doesn't make sense to keep taking it to the shop. It, it's time to get a new one. Now, uh, this position from primarily from uh, the Air Force, but supported um, elsewhere the, with the department, uh, has raised questions from a sizable community of lawmakers, non-governmental analysts, and activists um, who are not fully confident uh, in the methodology used to to evaluate to, to determine these numbers and to compare either the technical feasibility of life extension um, or the potential costs associated with that. Um, they've raised questions about the original analysis of alternatives that was undertaken in 2014. Um, and they've been really pushing uh, for an independent, comprehensive study that evaluates um, other options to extend the Minutemen 3, uh, potentially changing the number of ICBMs could be part of that. But uh, the details are a little bit unclear that that's been deferred to the study to determine. Um, and they've also, some of these uh, members of sort of this group have, have called for a suspension of the GBSD program in the interim um, so that resources could be reserved if it is determined that another option is available and that that option would be better. Um, this, you know, this idea was raised during the last budget cycle. GBSD was still funded, um, but it's likely to reappear again. And so it's something we have to keep an eye on. Okay, thanks very much. It's uh, time to take some questions from the audience. Um, all of you out there can participate by using the raise hand function on the app or submit a question in writing using the Q&A function. Now, when I do call on you, please uh, unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation. With that, uh, first question, first hand up there is Mark Buckham. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Terrific. Uh, hey, my question is, um, do, do you believe that that Putin believes in nuclear superiority? And is he posturing Russia to field a first strike capability as soon as the new START treaty expires? And then what, what implications would, would uh, that have for US nuclear force posture, especially GBSD, if Putin is aiming for nuclear superiority and a first strike capability? Thank you. Well, let me start. Um, it, first of all, it's nice to hear your voice, Mark. I hope uh, you've been well. Um, Quite frankly, um, that's not what we examined in this particular report. Uh, and therefore, any, any discussion of what Mr. Putin's uh, ob ultimate objectives are uh, would be purely speculative, I think, on our part. Uh, as has been said a lot in the last few weeks, you know, the only one who knows what's in Mr. Putin's head is Mr. Putin himself. Uh, and therefore, um, we, uh, it, 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 I'm just not going to venture uh, an opinion one way on that. But to a certain extent, it's irrelevant. Um, what the United States decision makers and policymakers and military analysts, including those who, um, you know, RAN works with, um, need to do is to uh, uh, analyze reality, analyze what the objective uh, force is uh, and what the actual force is and what the trends in that force are and what the capabilities that force has uh, and then uh, make decisions concerning our own capabilities, both uh, offensive and defensive, uh, accordingly. So, um, you know, we, as, uh, as uh, Alexandra pointed out, uh, they are replacing all their Cold War systems. Uh, right now, they are still uh, constrained by uh, by START, and uh, I, I think we've 
we've uh, so that's one of the reasons why I thought it was good to extend it for an additional five years. So uh, we'll need to continue to monitor that very, very closely, just as we have for the past 60 some odd years. Okay, here's one uh, that was uh, sent in. Uh, Mark, did you have a follow up? Uh, well, it, 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 it's it's really more to the point that we're seeing them build um, the Sarmat, uh, and they have a tremendous capability to produce uh, warheads that the United States lacks. Um, and so, doesn't that sort of reinforce the need to maintain uh, GBSD or ground-based um, deterrent that, uh, that that adds numbers and, and hardness and and uh, makes that challenge of a first strike uh, that much harder. Granted that we can't predict what Putin will do, but looking at what he is doing um, suggests that that um, ICBMs for the United States are more important than ever. Well, I think it also, uh, thank you for raising that, Mark. I think it also argues that uh, the United States uh, needs to uh, continue to modernize uh, and enhance its, uh, the, its, the capabilities of its uh, nuclear weapons uh, infrastructure. By that, I mean the um, national uh, security laboratories and the nuclear production facilities that are owned uh, by the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, it may come as a surprise uh, to many people uh, that um, the United States uh, currently does not have the capability uh, to manufacture uh, plutonium pits um, without going into the technical detail. Uh, a plutonium pit uh, is an essential component uh, of every nuclear weapon in the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Um, we used to produce up to a thousand uh, or more uh, plutonium pits at a facility called Rocky Flats um, outside the city of metropolitan area of Denver uh, during the Cold War. Uh, but we shut that down um, in the early 1990s as a result of concerns about compliance with safety and environmental rules at the, at the site, but also because the Cold War was over and the uh, George H.W. Bush administration was taking a number of unilateral steps uh, to reduce, uh, you know, the overall size of the U.S. nuclear modernization programs. Um, and there was no need for new pits uh, because there was, they had stopped production of the W-88 warhead for the Navy. Um, now we get to the point where as we embark upon life extension programs and um, begin to field new uh, delivery systems uh, that we need to be able to manufacture pits again as a nation. I find it absolutely astounding that as the major nuclear power in the world, uh, we do not have the capability to do that. So uh, the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration is uh, on, has been on a multi-year uh, campaign uh, to increase its capabilities uh, across the board. Um, they've gotten strong support from the Department of Defense, from the Office of Management and Budget, the White House, uh, as well as uh, congressional committees to carry out this modernization program. So we've been talking about the amount of money that needs to be spent uh, to um, modernize uh, the nuclear delivery systems. At the same time, we need to make sure we're uh, investing uh, what we need to invest to ensure that we can produce and, uh, and ensure that our nuclear uh, weapons remain safe, secure, effective, and reliable. Um, well, speaking of uh, warheads, here's a question from Robert uh, uh, Hasty. The RAND report seems to focus on delivery and survivability options for new modern nuclear force. Can you comment on the need for improved nuclear warheads with survivable ground penetrating capabilities that can provide improved lethality with lower collateral damage effects by effectively coupling ground shock energy with lower yield weapons to hold the hardest, high value, deeply buried tunnel targets at risk that our adversaries use to protect their most valuable assets. Well, uh, that's not part of our report. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I'd have to give it some thought, but I'm not going to venture uh, 
uh, venture a, a comment on something that uh, we have not studied. Okay. Um, here's uh, an interesting one from Lawrence Averbeck. When the Peacekeeper missile was developed, a rail garrison concept was suggested, but ultimately not used. What are your thoughts on the utility of rail garrison for future ICBMs? Uh, well, again, I, uh, I will take this, uh, not so much because it was uh, uh, in our report, but because people like Dave Deptula and I lived it uh, for a period of time. Uh, when we were, uh, when we, the Air Force, uh, was developing the, uh, what was first known as the MX and then ultimately known as the Peacekeeper missile, uh, there were, I don't know, 30 different concepts uh, for how you achieve, could achieve uh, mobility. In other words, have missiles not in fixed silos or not all your missiles in fixed silos, uh, but be able to have a number of them that could move about uh, to enhance their survivability, much like uh, the uh, Soviet Union at the time uh, had uh, mobile, uh, both fixed and mobile ICBMs. What we ran into is, I mean, there were a number of different technical uh, approaches and solutions to it. What we ran into is we have a fundamentally different uh, context in which to try to deploy mobile ICBMs than the Soviet Union did. The Soviet Union's a huge country, spans 10 time zones. There are parts of uh, the Soviet Union, now Russia, that are essentially uninhabited. Uh, when you fly over it, as I've done on a couple of occasions, uh, when I was assigned over there, uh, you fly for hours and all you see is the taiga, you, you know, the, the wooded areas. So um, it is, uh, you know, it's there is greater opportunity for the Soviet government, now the Russian government, to build, uh, build ranges where they can have mobile ICBMs. We don't have that. We're a much smaller country. Um, we had thought about putting a mobile system in, uh, at one point in the state of Nevada, and there was a lot of public pushback, political pushback, uh, from the citizens of the great state of Nevada. Uh, to doing that. So it just essentially became too hard to do from, I think, the terminology that was used at the time, uh, the public interface uh, aspects uh, of all that. Um, now, um, I, for one, don't lose any sleep over that. Uh, I think the notion that somehow the uh, ICBM force in its entirety is vulnerable has been greatly exaggerated over the years. Uh, we have 400 plus uh, missiles, 450 silos, I think, currently uh, in order for uh, an adversary to uh, uh, successfully disarm. Uh, that entire force would require, uh, you know, uh, exquisite uh, planning, exquisite timing, exquisite uh, precision, exquisite uh, weapons reliability. And I've been in the military long enough, as has Dave, to know that, you know, uh, the first plan do, uh, that doesn't always uh, survive contact with the uh, with the adversary. Uh, so um, I think that uh, the ICBM uh, is uh, is far more robust uh, and resilient than it is often given credit for. Alexandra, any anything to add to that as we wrap up? I think it's hard to to improve on what Frank said. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, there are still lots of questions out there, uh, but we've come to the end of our session. And I do highly recommend that you read uh, General Klotz and Dr. Evans' report. It's on the RAND website, and we'll, we've already included a link on the chat room uh, to it, but we were going to put it on our website as well. So with that, uh, Frank and uh, Alexandra, thanks so very much uh, for sharing your insights on this uh, critical topic. And from all of us at uh, Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day.